Okay. Ron, Mike. All right. For those that didn't hear, we just called this meeting to order. And all council people are in attendance. Joanne? The agenda items for discussion um, will be a presentation from Economic Development. Paula Elardo and John Fishback will uh, present the first item, which is for the first item. Oh, thank you, yes. uh, Madam Vice Mayor. Um, the Leading Edge is a campaign that we initiated, and Paula, excuse me, and Paula uh, took the lead on. And as you mentioned earlier. Uh, just did a fantastic job. This was really a special event. Uh, we had 115 people uh, that we had invited uh, show up uh, for a luncheon over at Tuscany Falls, and we talked about the leading edge that the city of Goodyear represents. We talked about the good examples that uh, successes that we've had, and we talked about changes that we are implementing, that we have implemented uh, to the review time that will benefit the people who were at the uh, at the meeting. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is introduce Paula, and Paula will introduce the Leading Edge video and show it to you, and then we'll have any comments or discussions that you might have. Paula? Thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to sit here and talk to you about the uh, showcase because it's something we're really proud of. And I have to say that this is the true culmination of bringing our two departments together, economic development and communications. I mean, it's like a true marketing department and it worked well from that standpoint. Um, this is what the room looked like. It was absolutely full and the, uh, we had people from around the, we had people from around the valley. Um, what, one of the things we really wanted to do was bring some of the brokers over here, developers, who have been in the East Valley and haven't done uh, work in the West Valley and we definitely accomplished that. We have a meeting scheduled Wednesday with a developer who has only done work in Chandler and Gilbert at this point and um, came up to us and said, you know, I'm really thinking about the West Valley. I'd like to meet with you right away. So this is the, the, just what we were planning for. Um, well, the reason we, that I thought we really had to have this showcase and we had to start doing something really proactive is oh. that... <laughs> um, hey, hold it still. We really have been very successful, and we needed to, why does he keep doing that? It does it by itself. It's, we've been very successful, and we really needed to tell the world our success story. One of the reasons we've been successful is at the end of the recession, or at the beginning of the recession, we were, had two million square feet of brand new spec buildings. So that's exactly what we needed, and people who are out there that have money are looking for these buildings now that they know are going to get at a lower cost. So they've been coming to Goodyear. We could have all of our buildings gone by the end of the fiscal year based upon the ones that we're finalists for. And so we need to become proactive, get our name out there, tell the story, and make people really aware of Goodyear. So we also need more spec buildings. It's very hard to get in this economy. Um, but not impossible, and we need more finished business parks. So we wanted to spread the word, and we wanted to do it through third-person testimonials where people were talking about us, not us just talking about ourselves. And so we had that with our speakers. We did gain awareness across the valley of our strengths, and one of the other things we did that we don't think anybody else has ever done is we recognized the developers and the brokers who have helped us, and we gave them these gorgeous black and silver plaques that went with the logo. And we've gotten a lot of thank you for that and said, you know, like, geez, I've never been recognized before. The speakers, John basically kicked the whole thing off and then we had Curtis Spencer of IMS, actually I should say, worldwide for foreign trade zones. We asked brokers, what does it take to get you out of your, you know, element and over here to come to a to um, a luncheon and hear about Goodyear. And we're, you know, almost like the king of foreign trade zones soon. And that's something the brokers don't know a lot about, but they can certainly benefit from it. So we were teaching them about the benefit of, tra of uh, foreign trade zones. Um, Fred Stiles, we recognized him from EJM because he started it with his land. Um, uh, Kevin Rogus of Duke Realty is applying now for one, and Sean 
uh, Walters, the CEO of Sunbell Holdings, um, spoke because they also have one in Palm Valley 303. And he also stood there and told people why Sunbell Holdings, which is normally a residential developer, he said that they watched Goodyear for quite a while and saw, he said, you seem like you were successful. You got everything you tried for. So we decided to go into the commercial business as well, and they got a partner, um, and they're now in the, they took over Suncor's, all of their things, including their commercial. Ron Jones, of Sub-Zero, the plant manager, also came and talked about the successes and why Sub-Zero came. The marketing elements that we introduced, first of all, I want you to see, we sent out the normal um, email presentation and you know, we got about 20 responses and then we had planned to send out a formal invitation and this went out to everyone and the, min the minute this went out, um, which Michael designed, we had about 70 people call us. So everybody can see, gorgeous. Um, and Harry and Paul have really great contacts in, in the business, and so we got a list from uh, one of the realty firms, and we actually sent out to about 350 uh, brokers with the hopes of getting 100. We figured about a third, usually, and we did. We, they were coming in at the very last minute. We were worried that we would have too many to fill the room. Um, the other thing is the in-depth profile. We have not had one of these in Goodyear, so it's this book. Um, that really, and you see everything sort of ties together where we use the Tuscany as the look mm -hmm. and um, made it the leading edge. So this really gets into the benefits of our city. This is for the in-depth, for people who are really interested. One of the other things, and we found this at recent conferences, is a good idea for a leave behind. And so a week before the event, I said to Michael, I have an idea for a brochure. I'll write it up, lay it out for you, and can you do it in a week? He sort of gave me a look, and then, yes, he did it in a week. Um, and so we got this small one, which is really good for leave-behinds when we go to conferences and introduce ourselves. Like we said at the solar conference, because um, Suntech announced at this conference about being in, in Goodyear, every booth that we walked up to and said we're from the city of Goodyear, they said, oh, you're where Suntech is. And it would have been great to have this at the time, which we didn't have. What do these figures represent? I'm sorry. Oh, those are the, um, it's a list of major employers and the amount of employer, employees that they have. They change constantly, so rather than say it's 900, it's Lockheed Martin 500 to 1,000, so it's a range. Thank you. Um, the other thing that we did is we developed a new website, which I'm not going to go into to show you, but if you can, go into our page, just click Economic Development button on the front page, and you'll see uh, the website that looks like, you'll see the le leading edge, and the words come out to our slogan, which is Your Edge for Success. <coughs> um, and we have developed with the engineering department interactive maps so that someone can say, I want... I want to see, uh, I want a 200 acre parcel. You can just click on that, it'll pop up the parcels. It'll have an information uh, balloon on it. And um, for instance, on buildings, we're even doing video. Paul goes out and does video and does like a virtual video of the inside of the buildings for, the, for our clients. Now, the other thing we worked on is a video and um, Nora worked very hard in this video, and I, she worked so hard that it probably cost us half of what it would have normally because she did half of the work looking at all the raw footage and everything and listening to constant music and, and bringing us all kinds of options. And so, um, Eddie, if you'll roll the video, please. business climate will be your edge for success. Goodyear has been a great place to grow my business. In the last 10 years, we've more than doubled our workforce.
Goodyear has great access to rail, air, and the freeway. The major criteria for choosing Goodyear was the city's ability to meet our aggressive building timeline. Goodyear was always quick to answer our questions. It's relaxed, yet refined lifestyle. Goodyear is a place where newcomers feel at home right away. It only took one visit to Goodyear for us to know that this is a quality community. of opportunity, lifestyle, and location. Thank you. Um, and the um, logo that you saw at the beginning of the end, that was Alec Coley of our Arts Commission. Did that work for us? And the other thing, um, we we want to show you is that this is the map that was shown to people. One in three are the foreign trade zones that are applied for in uh, the Greater Maricopa Foreign Trade Zone. And it, here is EJM's uh, property. And this is Sunbell Holdings property for the FTZ. And this is the Duke property this, that's uh, just recently applied. Now at this point, one of the things we wanted to do was tell them about our successes. And I want to give you really good news. These are in the past two years the companies that have located here. And we've added a couple to the uh, slide even that we had at that event. Um, you have Amazon.com, um, the original and the expansion, um, the SunTech, Tower Automotive, Sub-Zero, and Project Data, which is a build to suit in uh, Goodyear, uh, that project in Goodyear Crossings. And Prime Solutions is a company that's a defense contractor and they're using the military reuse zone. They just hired people through that process. They're going to hire 10 engineers um, by January. So this, is, this is, was an at-home business. And these people came into us and said, we need totally secure space because we're in the defense industry. And so they're located um, in the, with the same type of security that Lockheed has. So this is a really good success story. So we've already absorbed or built almost 2,000 square feet in the past two years. Two million. I mean, two million. <laughs> Thank you. And 184 million in capital investment, and what will be jobs for um, over a thousand employees. Um, we're also finalists now for two projects that would absorb another 868,000 square feet with a 78 million dollar capital investment and jobs for 600 if we get either of the if we get those two projects. So this, one of the things we wanted to leave with them was what are the keys to good your success, and that's really what's in this brochure. It's our business-friendly attitude, our responsiveness to timing, 
and uh, the location that makes logistics really simple, basically our freeways and our transportation accessibility to rail and, and air. And our workforce, um, within an hour's drive, based upon our freeways, the entire valley can reach us within an hour, 2.5 million workers. Our demographics is that we have a highly educated population, a great quality of life. We can offer some unique incentives. We have a large redevelopment area of which the airport's the center, which uses the giplet. That military reuse zone, our airport is only one of two in the valley that can use the military reuse and um, the FTZs. Basically, it all boiled down to opportunity, only 10% of our city being <coughs> developed. And one of the things that was announced when we talked about development timing at this, this event, John announced that um, our what had been 30 days for normal plan review for construction was going to now change to 20 days, which is what most of the Valley cities do, and tenant improvements would go from 15 days down to 10, plus our negotiated three-day turnaround for really, really big, big projects. That practically, practically got a standing ovation from the audience. This really, <laughs> this really helped, and it made a difference. So I have to thank John for making that possible. And we, we did um, introduce them to Ed Kulik, too, who is really an important part of our economic development team because a lot of how and why we get things done is, is through Ed Kulik's department. So any questions, comments? Uh, I just want to say outstanding. It was energetic. I love that um, your whole department is aggressive. I, I think that the entire package, uh, uh, marketing tools and the branding of it is outstanding. I do think that you need to have business cards that match it just for your, your department. I think that would just, you know, really tie it all together. I might not have any money. You don't allow anybody else to do it. <laughs> <laughs> We're the logo cops. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There you go. But it, it is. It's just, it's wonderful. And I know it's going to pay off. It will. It Thank will. you. What does this total program cost financially to put together? Um, the, the whole showcase costs about $9,000 to do. Um, we did it across two budget years. We we spent the money on this on the brochure. We the brochures done last year out of last year's budget. That was about um, three thousand dollars, and this one was about one thousand dollars. So cheap and high price. Well, we're doing them digitally. You don't want to print too many, as you see. Things get out of date very fast around here, mm. including the video now. I'm very impressed. It cost twice that. Everything everything could be edited, money. right? <laughs> Yes. It was twice that it had been worth the money. Yes. Yes. Well, the video, it's, the video cost about $20,000, and that was cheap. That's a $40,000 video. What did you pay off? Oh, me? Oh, I, got, <laughs> I got nothing for that commercial. But, I mean, we have, we have to say we have to thank the um, IDA, the Industrial Development Authority, because they um, have given economic, allowed economic development to spend $55,000 of their money, and that's basically what is the type of thing that we're spending the money on to market the city. Paula, I thought you, I was, I had the opportunity to be there with, when you had the uh, rollout. I thought you did a great job. question I have is any, I know you said you get some positive feedback, but as a result of that, and you took them around the SunTech, any, you know, they seemed to be pretty, you know, jazzed up when they left, you know, especially with the, the, the way the thing was all presented. Any feedback to date on any, I know you can't talk about any big leads in, in the uh, works as a result of uh, uh, getting those developers to, uh, I, I think we'll have some very positive. I think Wednesday's meeting will be very positive. And we have another local um, broker who just today said, I've been working with another client, trying another company from California that says they want to be here. Uh, let's partner. Let's work together and, and help get them here. So that effort, yeah. you can tie it directly back. That's directly. great. Mm -hmm. That's great. Are we doing an aggressive uh, sales campaign in California? Well, we're not. GPEC is. GPEC and is. Our, um, we, as a result, can, when, when something happens with GPEC and when we go on trips, we can leave them with our brochures. Now, we do go out and go to conferences, and that's where we can, you know, like the biotech or the solar, and there we can contact the different companies and different booths and, and use our, our information and leave behinds. We have to market the valley as a whole, too, mm -hmm. but we can also specifically market our own city. It is, they've expressed a concern for uh, their businesses moving out uh, of the state. And I hope they're moving this way. So. Well, we heard with the new governor that there should be a lot of them moving this way. So <laughs> we're hoping. Governor won't be? <laughs> that the taxes may make a difference in California eventually. 
Well, you know, today I attended a, a GPEC event uh, that the ambassadors had, and and um, and they had a uh, event for site selectors, and we talked about that prior to this time. And these site selectors were from New York and Chicago and New Jersey, and they're the top site selectors, and. Uh, they kept continually bringing up Suntech's name mm -hmm. and saying that really this is wonderful for our city. They are recognized all over the world and it will continue to bring us business and one after another. <coughs> and they also uh, um, complimented how well organized our team was and how they presented the city in just the right light. And they seem to have researched and they knew what the client wanted and so many times when the client comes, uh, they're given information, but it's information that doesn't mean anything to them. And so uh, my hat goes off to you. It was just an excellent, and, and we're just going to continue to reap the benefits of that. And the good news is that Harry and I had to miss that because we were working on the one that we're a finalist oh, on. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Thank you. Okay, thank it was you. a great presentation. Right. Our next item is related to the budget and the revenue and tax rate policy presented by John Fishback, Larry Lane. And Ann Dysak? Yes. Uh, Eddie, can you put up the other? Okay, tonight, uh, tonight's agenda, we've got uh, background information. I'll give you some uh, brief background regarding the economy, budgets, and forecast, and discussion of revenues. Uh, then I'll turn it over to Larry, and he'll give a brief overview of property tax rates and the rainy day fund. And then we'll turn it over to Anna Dizek for the discussion of the dashboard. And the dashboard is something that I'm really excited about. This is, as you will see, it's something that uh, we'll be able to, we use for five-year projections. It's something that is built by Anna in our finance department. So it's homegrown. And as you'll see, it will automatically change totals as we put in new tax rates and so forth and it will automatically put up on the screen. And tonight we will be saving those that are up on the screen. So as we get into the dashboard discussion, and we have as much time as you want on that, we'll discuss the different scenarios. What if we cut a tax 0.25%? And that will automatically recalculate the budget, the deficit, if, if so, uh, the structural imbalance. And so we will be saving those and we'll be able to print them all off and present them to you at a later date. This is the budget schedule. Uh, as you can see, we go back to August 23rd when we had the investment policy uh, work session in September, the debt refinancing work session, November 1st, uh, the financial reporting work session, November 8th was the first quarter review work session. Uh, the 15th tonight is the review of revenue and taxes. Uh, the council retreat on this subject. In January, we will have a mid-year financial review. And January and February, we will have a review and balance of base budgets. March, we will have an executive management budget review. Uh, March also, we will have the draft CIP for next year. And April, we will be discussing with the council the different uh, budget work sessions for the fiscal year 11-12 budget. May, we will have the adoption of the fiscal year 11 and 12 tentative budget. June, we will have the adoption of the final budget for fiscal year 11 and 12. And in July, we will have the property tax levy to support that budget. Uh, over the last couple of years, significant declines in major revenues have occurred. We experienced a tremendous decrease in development-related revenues. We have seen a decline of about $30 million in development-related revenue over the past three years. Uh, the, the details of that development-related uh, are $10 million decrease, construction sales taxes, $19 million decrease, and even state shared revenue has decreased uh, by $2.3 million. Now, the $19 million I mentioned as the decrease in the construction sales tax. That's from the high year of 2007 when we collected $22.7 million in construction sales taxes in one year. Mm -hmm. um, in 2005, we had $8.9 million. 
2006, $15 million. 2007 was the 22.7. Uh, 2008, $17.7 million. 2009, $12.8 million. 2010, so last year we had $5.4 million. We thought we were getting pretty bad then. But so far this year, for the first three months, we have collected $960,638. So we have a budget this year of only $3 million. And we're so far tracking that we will collect that. But that is a significant difference from the $22 million that we collected in 2007. During the same time period, we've had additional costs that the city's been experiencing, both the debt service costs and the operating costs for the stadium, which combined are over $8.3 million. How much, how much is that again? $8.3 million. And we have the operating cost of the CIP and then the employee health insurance and benefit costs that have increased. Now, if I understand correctly, John, out of that 8.3, is it about 7.5, the general fund? That's my, yes, that's 7. correct. 7.5 is yes. general? Yes, and 800,000 is the payment for the uh, general bond, uh, okay. from general obligation bond. The general fund subsidy is set by 7.5 7. million, yes. John? You will have also the, uh, <clears throat> what we have, generated in funds for the uh, year on that stadium. Was that in this report? Uh, it won't be discussed this evening, but we can certainly get that for you. We have those figures. so Because yes. I'd like to balance those two. Uh, the balance, it will be roughly $2 million collected, roughly. At one time, we figured it was about 1.8, so it's yeah. probably around $2 million. So yeah. it's cost us over a year uh, $2 million approximately to no 5.5 uh, it costs us uh, we I mean, we collected revenues of 2 million okay against expenses of 8.5 or 7.8 so when we talk about 7.5 million 7 we're talking about 7.5 net loss or subsidy whatever you want to call it that's in addition to what the operations are not a net loss uh, that would be a gross loss uh, if whatever you call it uh, it'd be a net Expense of roughly 5.5 million. Okay, but you got you got 5. Point, what three going from the um, debt service transfer of the general fund, and then the other two million plus is the operational shortfall. That's correct. So the grand total of the general fund, the 7.5, is a combination of debt service as well as the uh, operating loss, or whatever you want to call it, for for the for the stadium. Of That's correct, Joe. Yes. John, for the health insurance, is that the one you told us, I think, at the last meeting, that that's kind of front-loaded? Yeah. So <coughs> that will... Yes, it is. <coughs> in the, it will be the next quarter that it won't look so high, or when do we expect that to level uh, off? It'll uh, get to be less uh, each quarter, so... So it just kind of prorates down? Yes. Okay. Uh, budget balancing strategies. Um, to help offset the impacts of the revenue side, the re city's employed a number of strategies uh, to affect the balance of the budget. Reductions to date have totaled approximately $16 million on the operating expenses that we have cut from the budget. The city eliminated 78 full-time positions from the payroll. Uh, this occurred in 08 and 09 and 10. A total of 592 authorized funded positions was reduced by 78 to 514. For fiscal year 10 and 11, 507 of the 514 authorized positions are funded. Seven positions aren't, but we've kept them on the books, uh, primarily because we have acting people in them. For example, uh, Sandra Healy uh, is serving as the assistant to the mayor and the council. Uh, she is actually the city's trainer, uh, so we have that position frozen uh, because she's in this other acting position. As of November 8th, 2010, the city has 499 full-time employees on staff. Again, there's 507 authorized. Uh, the yellow paper to the council, which I, you have in front of you from this evening, uh, shows in one of the reports the employees per thousand uh, capita. We have, beginning in 
fiscal year 97 and 98, 12.45 employees per thousand. We are now down to 7.81 employees per thousand, which is the lowest in 14 years that we're aware of. Uh, and that is significant. That's a five employee per thousand decrease while we've been growing exponentially. And you, excuse me, John. Go ahead. How seriously uh, is the factor of 7.8 for services to, the, to uh, the residents of this community? How serious? Uh, yeah, well, see, go from 12 to 7. Well, it's obviously having a, a tremendous impact. We've been able to do a lot of things smarter and better. Um, how much longer we can continue to do that, we don't know. Uh, but we do have uh, a tremendous response from the workforce. Uh, they have been responding uh, with great enthusiasm and great vigor in accomplishing the job that they have. We are doing some things uh, less frequently. For example, uh, we don't oversee the parks anymore. And that's not only saving us money in uh, seeding and stuff, but it also saves us watering right. fees. Um, and I think Joe asked about one of the payments that we had in the Liberty for Liberty Water. Uh, we spend a lot of money for water, and that's up in the Liberty area. We spend just as much down in uh, the, for the ballpark and things like that. So doing that, uh, Dick, we've been able to uh, be responsive to the citizens' needs. As you know, we have uh, changed the uh, uh, solid waste, the trash bulk pickup. Uh, we were able to cut three people, I believe, because of that, and a truck. Uh, so by doing all of these things, we've been able to maintain the services without much impact to the, the citizens. So you've really, really tightened the nut on this whole thing. Uh, we believe we have. We believe that we've tightened it about as much as we can, though, uh, although we're continuously looking at different things that we can do to save money. We're going to have to look hard at 11 12. That's right. And then as Joanne, uh, as Councilmember Osborne asked, you know, we'll, we're starting to look at the revenue side also because, uh, you know, on that side alone, we've been able to do things like the fire agreement with Litchfield Park, which is, I think, around $560,000. Uh, we're talking with other agencies right now about how we can share other services with Litchfield Park. We have the new agreement with the town of Buckeye and the town of Litchfield Park where we have shared um, building inspection services. So there's a lot of things that we uh, still can do and we're still pursuing aggressively. Thank you. One, Thank you. One of the concerns, and I think it kind of drives the point home when you show the employees that you have right now and you backdate it, and if you back out the ballpark, if it's 400, whatever it is, and you backdate it to the point where we were maybe two to three years ago with those same employees, one of the concerns I have, and it has to do with the presentation we had the other day, is as a result of cutting, 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 how are our streets faring? I mean, if we keep trimming the repair, do we get to a point in which the overlays aren't any successful anymore because we couldn't afford to do those, so now we're ripping up and, and it's costing us actually, we're, we have short-term savings, but it's costing us more long-term as a result of not having money to do the regular maintenance. So, you know, that's one area that I, I really want to take a, a look at this time we go through, because I, I know it's always been a money crunch, but I'm worried that we're, you know, the pay me now, pay me later scenario, we're saving a couple bucks, but we're looking at major expenses down the road. So that's that's one of my concerns. You're very that. correct, Joe, and we are taking a careful look at that as we prepare this year's budget. We're also looking at, uh, you know, basically it's going to be a budget as usual. I mean, so just go forward. But we're looking at expenses for the road maintenance. We're looking at expenses for uh, landscaping and landscaping maintenance and how to bring landscaping to the parts of the streets that are missing. And that's an estimate we have right now. The square footage uh, determined it's going to cost about $2.2 .2 million to bring up the landscaping to the standards throughout the city uh, in areas that are missing. But we're looking at that. We're looking at increased uh, water uh, rates. Uh, so that's going to add an awful lot uh, to the city's operating budget next year. Fortunately, we have decreasing electricity rates because of the agreement that we you just approved uh, in purchasing the streetlights that will help save us a hundred two hundred thousand dollars 
So uh, those are uh, basically the changes that we'll have that the council will be looking at. Then, you know, we also have to remember the employees. You know, it's been three years since there's been an increase for the employees, so we're also weighing what, uh, what do we need to do, if anything, what can we afford to do uh, that will recognize the employees and the job that they've done over the past three years without uh, increases. Yeah, that was one of the reasons why I asked the question on the Liberty Water because I think it was like 85000 or something like that, and if that's monthly, and they get a 20% increase or 25 or 50 that they've been talking about, sure. that's just, that's going to really hurt us. So uh, we got to really kind of stay on top of, of that from a protest standpoint because yeah. that's a significant impact on us if they get those rate increases they're looking at. Yes, I, I believe that we had calculated that the rate increase that was recommended by the ACC uh, would cost us, I believe, about $196,000 just on the area north of I-10. I right. Okay. And by the way, the uh, in the report you'll see in, in red letters under the employees per capita, uh, it's 7.81 employees per thousand um, with the ballpark, and it's 7.42 without the ballpark. So it had that kind of impact on it. The uh, other balancing strategy that we've been using is the uh, use of uh, one-time resources. We've, uh, the council has approved the use of $2.3 million in construction sales taxes two years ago, I believe it was, for operations. Authorized the use of $3.1 million from the fund balance last year, and there was a transfer this year from uh, the PIC bonds, you'll recall the balance, was $3.2 million, and we used that to pay off the debt early. The revenue enhancement, I've already mentioned, we had the implemented tax changes of sales tax of 0.05%, uh, use tax, and the rental uh, taxes. And we updated all of the user fees and the IGA for the development services and the fire reimbursement. Oops. Managing through the recession. Um, since I've been in Goodyear for two years now, uh, over, a little over two years, I've gone through two budget, budget cycles. And unfortunately, it's all been cut, cut, cut. Um, but as I mentioned, the employees, I am really proud of the uh, city employees of the city of Goodyear. Uh, they have responded tremendously. They have responded without uh, complaint, much complaint. And they have responded... Uh, you know, vigorously to maintain the services. They understand the problem that the city is in, and they are doing everything possible that they can to help the city get through this difficult situation. We stopped all merit increases and cost of living adjustments in fiscal year 08 before any city did. And quite frankly, that has put us into this position that we're in, which is relatively good. I mean, the city of Goodyear is in pretty good shape considering where the other cities in the valley are and what the other cities have had to do and what they're going to have to do this year. The city of Chandler, for example, is faced with some significant deficits projected for this next year, and they have to address that this year, um, and they have to address that in the budget that they're preparing. We um, deferred capital projects. Um, just last meeting, the council agreed to the deferral of the MC85 project, uh, from Cotton Lane to Estrella Parkway. Uh, that action, the c approval of that will save us approximately $2.7 million by not having to fund phase two of the project. Other capital projects that the council recently approved to defer include the Bullard Wash, uh, Linear Park from I-10 to MC-85, and Estrella Park phase two. Both projects were delayed to do, due to lack of funding for the services and the operations. The city center was also deferred uh, due to the inability to finance in the long term. Uh, Right-sizing city departments, uh, we have an ongoing process where every position that becomes vacant, we look at carefully to determine whether or not that will be filled. For example, most recently, Mary Fightmaster, as you all know, has resigned from the city. She's going back to uh, South Carolina to be with her family. We've looked at that position and we decided not to fill it. We are trying to work with the people that we have 
Uh, Sandra accepted some additional responsibilities. Uh, Parrish got some additional responsibilities. Leanne Lundquist accepted some additional responsibilities. And Denise O'Brien accepted some additional responsibilities. So in doing that, we have come up with a way that we will not have to replace Mary. And we're going to go forward with that and see how it works. And um, uh, so we're constantly doing that every time a position becomes vacant. Uh, each department director has to justify that position totally to us before we proceed with filling the position. Reductions in force, as I previously stated, we've eliminated 78 positions from our payroll, which is a whopping 15 percent. And at the same time, I don't know what uh, uh, the city has grown, but we have grown over that same time period. Uh, still, we're growing at 3.4 percent uh, this last year, for example. So. Uh, as people grow, we continue to uh, pile on services and are able so far to meet them. John? Yes. Uh, you know, when you're talking about the employees and everything, I know the Arizona Republic was doing a story about retirement. How, how are we with our retirement? How do we shape up? How are we going to look at a problem with regard to that? I don't believe so. I think that we're doing pretty well with our retirement. Our total costs right now, this this current, is 6.76 percent of our total personnel budget goes towards retirement. The example that uh, was emailed to you recently uh, showed Orange County being 84 percent of their budget actually going towards retirement. I mean, that's an <laughs> inexcusable number. And we, we, we're nowhere near that, and we are nowhere near going to that. So right now it's at 6.76 percent. We had an increase over the past few years because the police uh, uh, retirement, basically. Uh, but even that, I forget the percentages. But even those are the 6.76 percent is including all uh, employee retirement systems. We have f three systems in place: the fire department, the police department, and the uh, Arizona State Retirement System. And was that the drop program then for the? Please. For the police department, that's the draft program, yes. You know, with you all, all three programs together, is the six point? Six point seven six percent. Includes all three? Yes. Okay, thank you. John, does that include the fact, I guess, that fire doesn't pay Social Security? Is that factored in there? Uh, it's not factored in, I mean, but uh, the point, uh, the fire does not, that saves the city about 6.4 percent right. for each firefighter, yes. So that, if that was figured into that cost, that would actually bring that cost down a little bit? Uh, probably, yes. Okay. Um, alternative delivery systems. Uh, one example is the city's partnership with Maricopa Library District. Uh, the city funds the space, and as you're aware, you know, the county is operating the library. Although it's a small one, it's 1,800 square feet. You know, it, and it's one of the highest uh, circulations in the system. It, it's going great over there. We we are looking at options that we have to to do that uh, within the city. Uh, we keep running up against. You know, we, we looked at could we move it into the Venita building, for example, or in, to these buildings over here, and we probably could squeeze it in. But then we're out of space for as the community responds and. It gets responsive to the uh, growth changes that will be occurring one of these days. Um, we are going to obviously have to hire additional people, and then we would not have space. I mean, so we're trying to balance all of those things because um, we don't want to cut off our nose to spite our face. To uh, is, is the uh, the county doing anything with us or planning on doing anything with us in the future in the building of a structurally them? building anything for us or helping us in the construction of a new library? The county doesn't have any responsibility to construct the physical facilities that's on the city. We are working with the county now to try to get an extension uh, because we're saving them money in effect uh, by having such a small operation that we are asking them to extend the life of the agreement we yeah. have with them. When is that they were able to build that big library up there in the <laughs> white tanks. White tanks, and uh, they just blow Have you light. seen it physically? I mean, just seen the it, it's picture. incredible. Yeah, it's a, it must be huge. Uh, it's Anyone it's the. Uh, you go out the uh, I forget which road, but you go out there, and it's right before you enter the, into the White Mountain oh. Tank par White Tank Mountain Park. It's very pretty. It's a beautiful facility. It's the same size 
as the facility that we were talking about building for as part of our city center. So I, there isn't a whole lot of population out there, but. Uh, I mean, it just doesn't make sense that they went out there instead of coming in here and do helping us with something. I would think they'd want to do that. Of course, they want to build it on their land, I suppose. Yes, I am. Uh, oh, well, yeah. another issue. Um, other examples of alternative delivery systems include services provided by the Southwest Family Advocacy Center. Uh, there we have a, a partnership providing quality investigations of abuse in the most uh, sensitive areas. And we're working there with uh, uh, several communities, City of Buckeye, City of Surprise that might be joining us, and the City of uh, Litchfield Park. City also provides mutual assistance plans with the review and building inspections, as I mentioned, uh, to the town of Buckeye and the city of Litchfield Park, and they reciprocate. And then the Sonoran Valley is also an area, Mobile, where we totally provide services via other agencies, such as the town of Maricopa for the fire and emergency medical services, and the county sheriff for the police uh, services. Employee and citizen input uh, into the budget process uh, we, had a, we have an employee budget task force uh, which has been working diligently for several years now. They identified uh, about 150 organizational saving ideas and we have been working through them as rapidly as possible implementing them. And a lot of those have been implemented and um, it's saving the city a lot of money. Uh, approximately 70 percent of the ideas have been implemented already or are under review. And so again, the employees significantly helped us with the um, achievement of many of the savings. We don't have a program by which we share in the savings with the employees, but we're looking at that. Phoenix, for example, just I think increased theirs to, uh, I believe it was $3,500. No, actually it was as much as $25,000. But anyway, so we're looking at that to see if there's some things that we can do there to possibly help. The thing that we have to remember, John, here are the concessions that this staff has made down through the years to help us really budget well. Now, we should never forget, and future council should never forget for what these employees have done. So that when the time comes that we're able to get more money into our budget process. This should, should be the first effort of the councils of the future to remember what these folks have done right now to help us through this recession period. Uh, uh, thank you, Council Member Sousa. I know that there's a lot of people out there listening, this, not this evening, but that will listen tomorrow night, that appreciate those comments because the employees have uh, done a fantastic, they've made a significant contribution. They surely have. So. Uh, we also had the Citizen Budget Committee, which provided, as you know, many uh, opportunities and suggestions for us. Uh, we're keeping running track of those uh, 27 ideas, I believe it was, and over half of them have been implemented, and we're still looking at a couple of them. And that was good. Excuse me. The um, reduction of uh, service levels least affecting the public. Some examples is, I mentioned already, the overseeding of the parks, which is saving us uh, not only materials but also in the water. Uh, the Parks Department has also cut back on uh, maintenance, right-of-way maintenance. <laughs> They're probably getting tired of me calling them and saying, the street isn't looking as good. <laughs> but, you know, I, I drive through the community and look at that, and there are times when you see weeds and, you know, the, we've lengthened the time that we're out there from I think it's every four weeks to roughly six weeks now. Um, it seems to be working pretty well. Uh, the swimming pool also uh, have reduced the hours significantly. Uh, the pool is open primarily when the kids are out of school. Other times that the facility is, is the other times it's closed at nights and on weekends. Uh, we have also reduced the frequency of the In Focus magazine. Uh, it's down to, I believe, six issues now uh, rather than 12. And we continue to look for ways to reduce costs and increase efficiencies. And then the final item I would just mention is consolidating organizational units. 
you know, we have eliminated two director positions uh, in the city of Goodyear. Uh, we both combined the water and public works departments for efficiencies, and Charles uh, McDowell uh, is our uh, public works director now and is doing a fantastic job at merging those two departments into one operating unit, and we're realizing savings every day from that merger. And then the other one, you'll recall we abolished the community services department, and we uh, did not replace that department director and we moved parts of the community services into different areas and so we still are offering all of those services but with uh, one less employee. And then we combined economic development and communications and I think what you saw this evening shows you that that was a really smart move and under the direction of Paula Elardo as the director and Harry Paxton as the manager of economic development, that is really uh, paying off big time for the city of Goodyear. John, one comment on that, uh, on the, the last items. The uh, fact that the, the neighborhood services, neighborhoods, have been getting involved in their own uh, upkeep of their parks to a point that, well, like Saturday we had cleanup day in the north suburb neighborhood. Uh, normally that would have been a burden on our parks department but getting volunteers from the community to do these things and be a part of it. And this is happening all over the country. Uh, the, uh, they're opening the new ski resort where I have my cabin up in Colorado. And what they're doing, even though this millionaire has come in with all his money to, and to rebuild everything that was there, they have volunteer days. They bring in the community and it's happening all over the country. We should utilize that as much as possible. Get those volunteers involved in their community, in their own community, to work on some of the things that we have in the past have hired people to do. So the volunteer work, I think, is, is really a way to go to save megabucks. And, and it helps the community. They, they're buying into it. Uh, we agree totally, Frank, and Judy Swatonic is our volunteer coordinator. And this last year, as I recall at the volunteer banquet that we had earlier this year, uh, I thank the uh, volunteers for, I believe it was in excess of 20,000 hours of volunteering to the city. And that's a significant growth over the past several years. And so it's still going up each year, but uh, we appreciate that comment very much. And the volunteers really do an awful lot of good for this city with uh, uh, no payback. And the ballpark, as a matter of fact, is I just noticed we are advertising for them in the paper for volunteers. And many people like to volunteer at the ballpark. We had, I believe it was 350 to 400 volunteers last year alone working at the ballpark. So that is tremendous. And that's people that we don't have to pay. So. Well, and we have the adopt the parks. I mean, that was a, right. a great Every park idea. is adopted exactly. now. Exactly. Yeah. Every park is wonderful. So. Yeah, and that, that's been great. And I know, uh, Joanne, uh, the, your group has adopted uh, it's Loma Linda. Loma Linda. And uh, I mean, without that, uh, we'd have city employees who have to do all of that. So that's tremendous. Uh, John, do you know how many, uh, maybe not off the top of your head, how many volunteer hours annually? They uh, contribute right now? Over 20,000. Over 20,000? 20, yeah. And, um, I mean, that's 20,000 if you divide it by 2,100 and some. I mean, that's at least 10, 11 employees that you would have to have on full-time paid staff in order to replace those hours. On the five-year forecast, um, the National Economic Outlook uh, Slowest economic recovery since the Great Depression. I don't think any of us are surprised to see that. Um, these forecasts and expectations that I'll be reviewing for the next minute or two, uh, they often change week to week. All of the information presented here is from the last several weeks. It's uh, from the month of October. Uh, still, the pace and timing of economic recovery is still unknown. Uh, there are varied perspective, uh, perspectives given by depends which forecaster you're looking at. Uh, basically, uh, the news that we're getting is all good news, bad news. Uh, there are positives to the current situation, but many problems still exist. 
And this is true for both the national, state, and local economies. Nationally, as I mentioned, the slowest economic recovery since the Great Depression. That source is the former Federal Reserve Vice Chairman, uh, Dr. Donald Cohn. Uh, the rest of the information on the slide is from ASU's W.P. Carey School of Business, and it was pu uh, information that was published on October 19th and October 22nd. Uh, the blue chip forecast accuracy winner, Dr. Sherry Cooper, and this is uh, uh, an award um, that from the economists themselves that recognize this, uh, she gives the forecast that's cautiously optimistic. Uh, she does not see a double dip recession, uh, and that's one thing that we've been worried about and constantly monitoring. Um, a five year economic forecast. Uh, information compiled from basically three sources, the Blue Chip Economic Indicators, a uh, leading newsletter that provides monthly consensus forecasts from 50 professional forecasters, the U.S. Office of Management and Budget, and the Congressional Budget Office, the CBO. At a, at a state level, uh, we have uh, the source is the Finance Advisory Committee, the JLBC presentation, which was made in September 29th um, of 010. And the state's credit rating was downgraded uh, in July to five, the fifth level of 10 investment grades, which was a major um, decrease. The downgrade, uh, they downgraded it due to economic weakness, structural imbalance, and constitutional limitations that the state's facing. The outlook shifted from negative to stable, but the rating lower than most other states. Uh, the city's credit rating at the same time has been sustained and affirmed, uh, which is super good news. Uh, GO bond ratings, uh, Moody's uh, uh, is still double A2. Uh, the PIC bonds recent ratings were S&P's a double A minus and Moody's a double A3. Uh, S&P states that the stable outlook reflects our expectation that pledged excise tax revenues will continue to provide strong coverage of debt service. So those were very positive things that Larry has worked with uh, diligently with the bond rating houses and has given them all the information that they need and they have made those conclusions just within the past three weeks. Number of current jobs to jobs uh, during the prior peak employment levels of 2007. Uh, the state of Arizona ranks 47th uh, of, uh, at 89.4 percent of the peak numbers. Uh, the peak numbers, we had 2,680,000 people employed in the state of Arizona. And we currently have 2.397 million. Uh, and so we're slightly ahead of Florida, Nevada, and Michigan, which isn't real good company to be in. <laughs> so. um, Five-year forecast, uh, Southwest uh, Valley economic outlook. Median home values are generally improving, but home sales are declining. Uh, Goodyear distressed index remains the same or lower than ne neighboring uh, jurisdictions, which is very positive and surprising, but it's very positive. For example, Goodyear is 63.4 percent. Avondale is 82.9 percent on the index. Buckeye is 72.9 percent. Again, we're 63. 0.4 percent, and Litchfield Park is 63.4 percent. So we're the same as Litchfield Park. Now that means that it's only worth the value of. What is that percent? It, it's percentage the market distress index is a value that provides a measure of the percentage of the market that consists of pre foreclosures, lender owned properties, and short sales. Both active listings and monthly sales are considered for this. So the higher that number, the, <laughs> the worse, the you, worse are. you are. Yeah. The more distress okay. and the more, you know. At the same time, you know, our single family residential permits are continuing to decline. Last month we issued 
17 permits for the month. And this is a city that issued as high as I believe it was 287 permits per month back in 06 and 07. So this, and that's, we've only had, I believe it's three months, or two months, excuse me, two months below 17 permits. And th that was back a couple years ago. But so this was the lowest permits issued in a long time. On a positive note, job growth has been very good for the city of Goodyear. And you just heard that from, from Paula. I mean, we have added 1,398 jobs, I believe it is. Um, and that's SunTech, you know, the 150 jobs uh, by the end of 2011. Sub-Zero's 388 jobs by the end of 2011. Others were Macy's was 250 jobs. Amazon.com was an additional 250 jobs. CTCA was 360 jobs. I mean, so all of these are just great beneficial things for the city of Goodyear. And as I'm sorry, John, is that a two or three year time frame? Uh, that would be two and a half years roughly. No. Yeah. And what's really great is not only are they high paying jobs, many of them, I mean CTCA um, and um, uh, Sub-Zero are going to be very well paying jobs, uh, but as you, as you know, the agreements that you have approved for some of these uh, economic uh, incentives pay them additional dollars for every Goodyear resident that they hire, which is I think a very innovative and creative thing that we're doing, that you're doing uh, for those uh, people out there that are trying to get the jobs into Goodyear. If, are we going to get, can we get any statistics on not just Sub-Zero, but the, in general, all of them? How many of those people that work in those jobs live in Goodyear? I believe so. We'll, we'll check on that, Frank, and, and yeah, get back to you. That'd be interesting to see. We will sure check on that. John? With your percentage of growth in home sales, there's like a peak in 2009. Was that the home buyer tax credit? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's like the credits. It's, you might remember the cash for clunkers. Whenever whenever that went away, the car sales. Uh, That's right. Thing, right, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, as part of the development of the fiscal year 11 budget, we have several major items that we'll be discussing with the council as the big picture is formulated in the preparation of the budget. Some of these key variables are the economic impacts, for example. Uh, under that, we have the 2010 census, uh, the growth trends, the development-related revenues, the assessed valuation, which is continuing to go down, and the electronic bill. <laughs> um, sorry, Joy. <laughs> I had to put that there. Uh, under legislative actions, we're constantly monitoring uh, the state unfunded mandates. We're constantly monitoring uh, state shared revenues. I was uh, pleased to hear a report from uh, Romina this morning that uh, she had dinner with uh, the two uh, majority leaders uh, of the upcoming Senate and House. And uh, they are looking at state shared revenues, but it's very low on the list. Uh, they acknowledge that the cities have successfully fought them at different steps of the way, and so they don't really want to take on the cities again. And so they're looking at uh, state shared revenues, but it's way down on the list. Uh, yes? At the Arizona Town Hall, that was one of the conclusions, was that uh, to protect the, the city's shared revenue, and that came from all of the groups. And I had <coughs> Senator, uh, Senator Burns in my group. And uh, he stated he feels we have to do totally away with him. And he was just, I mean, the rest of the group did not agree with him. And so he oh, was good. in, yeah, he was in the minority. So well, unfortunately, a, he's encouraging. retired. Now. Yes. <laughs> John, does, does Romina have a, have a concern that they'll kind of backdoor those issues where they'll just, the unfunded mandates, they'll start pushing cost off on the cities as a way of trying to balance their budget? Yeah, obviously, discharging. that's always our concern, and that's why we watch it so closely. Uh, but that is a, a big concern that we all have, and it's a concern that we need to constantly monitor. Romina's not going to have an easy job this year. I mean, with the new legislature uh, elected, they have a, a supermajority in the Senate. And the House, or not we, quite the House? It's my understanding. I thought they had it in both. but uh, They may, but I mean, so the, it's going to continue to, it's going to take constant monitoring on our part. 
Well, it's going to be difficult. The state's in trouble. That means we're in trouble. Yep. So we all have to make adjustments and sacrifices. So. That's right. And then uh, under legislative action also, we have the sales tax and the income tax uh, for state shared revenues. And then city policies that we're going to be discussing with the council. A couple of them I've already mentioned, but replacement funds are going to be a large part of the budget discussions this year. Uh, we have technology equipment. We have fleet and right-of-way and median plantings uh, that I mentioned earlier. We have employee benefits and compensation uh, that we're looking at. Uh, road maintenance, which Joe pointed out earlier, is of a critical concern. As you saw uh, a couple weeks ago, we have a, a, a 73, I think, average, uh, which is very good right now, but it will continue. It will continue to decline as we go forward. And then CIP projects, we have several of those that are uh, coming up. We have the telephone system that w is being replaced and things like that. And then tax policies and rates we'll be talking about in a little while with Anna and the dashboard that we're presenting this evening. And the program and service prioritization that we are constantly struggling to, to do and which I hope we'll be able to make some progress on this John, year. One yes. you don't have listed there that I'm concerned about, um, and I know it's going to be facing us, is going to be uh, fire down a mobile, because isn't that going to end uh, that contract come, come June, June 30th? 30th? Yes. yes. So won't that be an impact? Yes, also? it will. Uh, it's probably not as major an impact okay. as uh, some of these listed are. We've de we're developing right now scenarios uh, of how to deal with this. And uh, one of the scenarios, for example, we're looking at is, okay, what would it cost us to put two men down there uh, on an emergency medical uh, van, uh, which is what the Mobile residents, as you'll recall, asked for that night. And that won't, uh, it would cost us, I forget the specific numbers now, but it's less than $200,000 additional money uh, because we're already paying out $76,000. Uh, but we're looking at all options like that. Um, we're also looking at the other options. What, what will a four-man crew cost us? Uh, what will uh, the city of Mobile, because they are willing to, quote, negotiate with us. So we uh, need to find out from them shortly after the first of the year what are they looking for in order to maintain the service. Uh, so we've started that process. But we'll be having meetings with them. Have, John, have you at all discussed with the risk manager uh, concerning the employee's benefits and compensation? Yes. What might be done there? Yeah. Uh, we're looking at, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, several alternatives that are being drawn up on both benefits and uh, what do we bring back first if we bring anything back, some of the benefits that we've taken away or some salary increases or some, quote, bonus uh, payments that don't add to the salaries, uh, to the base salaries, and so th they would be less expensive in the long run. So we're looking at all of those options, Mr. Sousa. Thank you very much. The five-year forecast, then the assumptions, uh, the, the uh, growth factor assumptions that we're looking at, uh, we're looking at sales tax revenue increases of 5% annually each year. Uh, construction sales tax revenue increases, we have 2% that we're looking at in fiscal year 11 and 12, and 4% for each year thereafter. <laughs> and the operating expenditure increases we're looking at, base adjustments, uh, obviously utility costs are going up dramatically uh, for the town area north of I-10, and the city itself <laughs> is one of the contributing factors to that. Uh, we have the built-in utility increases uh, over the next five years, or next four years. Um, so the water costs are also going up and the utility increases. Now, as I mentioned, we are saving up roughly $200,000 on the electricity <coughs> next year for the streetlights. Uh, you know, just operating the streetlight system costs the city $1.2 million right now. So that's just for electricity. And now we'll be getting it for just under a million dollars because of the fact that we bought all of the light poles. Uh, CIP operating costs, uh, radio system, park and ride operating costs um, will be added in. Library costs increase each year until February, uh, to, excuse me, fiscal year 15 and 16. 
even if we stay in the interim location. Um, generally, we're looking at 3% increases for operating costs in 11 and 12, and 4% increases for each year thereafter. We have a projection of the mall opening in 14 to 15, uh, fiscal year 14 and 15. Uh, there is no guarantee of that. Uh, the when mall happens in 14 or 15. When is the dirt start? Uh, fiscal year 12. Uh, there's no uh, certainty of that yet. Uh, West Corps is unwilling to say when it will happen, uh, but we're working with them to, to achieve this. Well, they were very positive after the Leading Edge campaign, so we'll see. <laughs> yes. Uh, state shared revenues, uh, we are looking at that those should not be touched uh, by the legislature, but we always have to be prepared if they are, and we are not assuming that they are going to be swept. Uh, the structural deficit is the same as we've shown you uh, before. Uh, fiscal year 11 and 12 is going to be roughly $3 million. Uh, John, on the, uh, was it 303 uh, right-of-way payments? How many more fiscal years do we have of that? Uh, three more years, uh, $6 million. So we got, okay, so we got 222. So we, so we got 11, 12, 12, 13, so, okay. okay. It'd be nice if well, it'll help when that gets... And that comes back in. Yeah. Uh, the revenues and funds discussion that we want to talk about tonight are retail sales taxes, uh, restaurant bar sales taxes, hotel motel sales taxes, constru construction sales taxes, and the property tax. And then other revenues are determined by user fees, uh, park and recreation user fees, uh, development fees, permit fees, and uh, permit fees in general. And then we'll be talking also about the rainy day fund comparisons. Sales tax rates, the current Goodyear tax rates, uh, retail is 2.5 percent, uh, restaurant and bar is 4 percent, hotel is 5 percent, and the construction sales tax is 3.5 percent. What are the dates these were incorporated? Do you remember? What I will get to that in a moment, Thank yes. Uh, total retail sales tax uh, right now is 9.8 percent, and that's the city at 2.5 percent. The state at 6.6% and the county at 0.7%. Uh, now, do they have copies of this, uh, these comments? No. Oh, no. okay. I'm uh, ask for them after. I can get you them. Yeah. Total restaurant sales tax is 11.3%, and that's 4% uh, for the city. Uh, state's 66 again, and the county's 0.7%. The hotel motel tax is 13.27%, and that's 5% from the city, 6.5% from the state, and the county's 1.77%. I'm sorry, could you repeat that for me, please? The total hotel motel tax is 13.27%, city 5, uh, state 6.5, and the county 1.77. The co total construction tax rate is 10.8%, and that's the city 3.5, the state 6.6, .6, and the county 0 0.7. Where does uh, rental, car rental tax come? Do we have a car rental tax? It should be in so. 2.5. 2.5. Oh, it's in the retail. Yeah. Okay, here, Georgia, is the history of the adopted sales tax rates. 1987, uh, the city established 2% general sales tax rate uh, for all classifications. It established a 4% hotel, restaurant, and bar tax rate. So that's 1987. 1987. Yeah. 1995, the uh, two -tier. established the two-tier tax rate. So that was the for purchases that are greater than $2,000, and that was made at the 1.2% level. In 2004, the uh, Tax Policy Task Force recommendations, we increased the hotel tax rate from 4 to 4.5%. That's interesting, because I remember going just as a, uh, a citizen sitting on that, on that commission that last day when they raised that. Okay. Uh, we increased the construction sales tax rate from 2 to 3.5%. We 
We maintained the single item purchase rate at 1.2 percent, increased the single purchase amount limit from two to five thousand dollars. We reduced the combined property tax rate upper limit from two dollars and ten cents to a dollar sixty. We maintained the four percent sales tax rate on restaurants and bars and the two percent general sales tax rate and the tax force recommendations were adopted by the council and were effective in 2005. Since the 2004 policy task force made these changes, we increased the city's sales tax by 0.5% and that was in fiscal year 9 and 10 to 2.5% total and we implemented a use tax of 2.5% in fiscal year 9 and 10. So in 2009, uh, this general sales tax was increased, uh, for, as I mentioned, from 2 to 2.5. Two the hotel tax was increased from 4.5 to 5%. We reduced the number of rental units for taxation from 3 to 2. We established a use tax for purchases made outside of the state or unincorporated areas, and the council directed that we review this in 2012. We had estimated that the use tax would bring in about $250,000. The actual use tax collections were just under $500,000 last year. And they were all from businesses, a majority of it? I believe that it's fair to say all of them were from businesses. So if we wanted to be a little more business friendly, that could be a use tax that we would get rid of? It's certainly something that the council can consider, yes. But it's my understanding use tax is an equalizer. What it does is it keeps local residents from not being able to compete, compete unfairly from those outside. So if you buy it from outside, it's an equalizer. So I, I, don't, I don't view it as a, as a penalty on local businesses. I view it as an equalizer because the use tax is when you're making purchases outside of the city at a lower rate than what you can buy inside. But so. I also see the fact that businesses don't have the opportunity to buy their equipment within the city. And so rather than letting them just keep the extra dollars in their pocket, we're not. So that's how I view it. Yeah, I, I view it a little differently, but no, I, I appreciate it. I respect that. I'm just giving my opinion. No, no, I appreciate that. I, I have a que question on that. Um, is the use tax, uh, since it's buying outside the jurisdiction, is that one that is comes back on the federal tax forms? No. So that's not the same as, okay. Okay, and here's a, a summary of um, uh, Valley sales tax rates. Uh, both retail, restaurant and bar, hotel and motel, and construction. Uh, Avondale, uh, you'll see 2.5% uh, for retail and restaurant. Hotels, 4.5% and construction, 2.5%. If you just run down the uh, retail, for example, you'll see 2.5 Avondale, 3 in Buckeye, uh, 1.5 in Chandler, 1.5 in Gilbert, 2.2 uh, in Glendale, 2.5 for Goodyear, 1.75 in Mesa, 1.8 in uh, Peoria, uh, 2 in Phoenix, 1.65 in Scottsdale, 2.2 in Surprise, and 2% in Tempe. I'm sorry, John, is there a way to know, you might have to come back to us, um, which one of these do not have tax on their food? I believe Tempe. We have on. that, yes. Do you? Okay, thank you. We don't have that tonight. Oh, I'm sorry, we don't have it tonight. But yes, we have a, a study on that, so we'll get that for you. Oh, okay. Uh, restaurant and bars, 2.5% uh, in Avondale, 3 in Buckeye, uh, 1.8 in Chandler, 1.5 in Gilbert, 3.2 in Glendale, 4% in Goodyear, 1.75 in Mesa, 2.8 in Peoria, 2% in Phoenix. Uh, Scottsdale 1.65, 3.2 in Surprise, and 2% in Tempe. The Hotel Motel is really all over the place, 4.5 in Avondale, 3% in Buckeye, 4.4 in Chandler, 4.5 in Gilbert, 5.6 in Glendale. Uh, we're at 5%, 6.75 in Mesa. This is reflective of the recent changes that were voter approved in Mesa. 
5.6% uh, in Peoria, 5% in Phoenix, 6.65 in Scottsdale, 4.72 uh, in Surprise, and 7% in Tempe. So really, when you look back at restaurant bar, good years, it's a little Very higher, I'd high. say, yes. really. And, uh, but in the hotel motel, we're kind of in the, in the range. Yes. And the only thing I'd point out is that restaurant and bar, I mean, that was set a long time ago. But, no, I yeah. know that, but, but, you know, looking at future help and trying to reduce something, that certainly is one area we can be looking at. Okay. Uh, 21 cities statewide exempt uh, f food at grocery stores. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, they're mostly smaller cities, Bullhead City, Camp Verde, Colorado City. Uh, you do have Flagstaff in there. Uh, I don't can't pronounce this. Hawicha? Hawicha? Hawachuka. Sorry. Hawachuka <laughs> City, Jerome, Kingman, Lake Havasu, <laughs> Mammoth, Marana, Mesa, Oro Valley, Parker, Quartzsite, Sarito, Sarita, and uh, Suarita, and Sedona, uh, Superior, Surprise, Tombstone, Tucson, and Tucson. We've never tracked a percentage. Of what, I mean, what that percentage in revenue is. If we, if we did wait it's to very difficult to to yeah. guess on grocery stores. We have estimated. Uh, City of Phoenix, for example, uh, just approved the new food tax, and they they're represented 17 percent of the total, and that's raising 50 million dollars in the City of Phoenix. Right. So we estimate at least 17 percent of ours would be. Um, based on um, a percentage, I believe. John? Oh. I'm sorry. I mean, that was one of the, the items that I had brought up in the past, was that if there was a way for us to look at um, bringing that down, I mean, if, if we were to, and I think that's what comes up to your score, board dashboard. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. sorry, dashboard. Um, if we were to incrementally try to bring things down, um, and we were just, for example, you know, you start with the restaurant and bar or, or something like that. Or if we look at what does it mean if, uh, with the food, because that obviously affects everyone in the city. And um, that's why I've asked if there was some way, 17%, but what is that in, in real numbers, you know? It, it's more than $5 million each year for the city of Goodyear. 17.6% is the actual number. Uh, if we were to cut the food tax by 0.5 percent, the sales tax, uh, it would cost us an estimated one to 1.1 1 .1 million dollars. Where is the food tax? On the grocery stores? It's, it's no, it's in retail. It's in the. Oh, it's in retail. It's in retail. Yeah. So I'm saying if we were to separate it, okay, leave leave rest of retail alone. But if you were to separate food out, what does that mean? And so you're saying roughly 1.1 million dollars yeah. annually. Yes. And John, would there be a way to separate, even if we, we did a food, to separate it out and rather than maybe go to zero, to, and I don't know if this is an accounting nightmare for businesses to redo their cash registers, uh, is there a way to at least gradually bring that down to zero, maybe not hit it oh, all oh, at once, I know. but like no. a gradual well, take uh, the food out of the retail? Carefree, for example, uh, taxes, these are cities that tax food differently than the general sales tax. Carefree taxes uh, uh, food at 2%. And the general sales tax is three percent. Right. Glendale taxes it at one point eight percent, and the retail is two point two percent. Patagonia does two point five percent, and their sales tax is at three percent. Tempe uh, taxes it at one point eight percent, and their tax is at two percent. And Thatcher is at one point five percent on food, and their retail sales are at two percent. So. To answer your question directly, yes, there are ways that if we, and you can see this tonight, if you reduce something by 0.1 percent, what happens uh, to the sales taxes? So, so part, part of the problem, I can tell you administratively when it comes to sales taxes, we're in the state collection system. So as opposed to some of these others that you were mentioning about with Glendale, is they have a letter code and a number next to it for any of you, you know, filing taxes. So if you do the food and you create it, say, at 2% versus 2.5, you're, you're looking at another state code. 
So that can, that will, it would be better off as if you totally eliminated the food as opposed to creating another code at 2%, because then what happens is, is you create another code where a business can start filing wrong. Instead of paying the 2.5, they pay the 2% because they don't know what GY code is. And, the, and unfortunately, the state is not always up to speed on letting people know what those codes are when they change. So being in the state collection system, you may have an administrative nightmare from an enforcement standpoint if you slowly graduate that and create another code as opposed to just saying food is tax exempt, you know, because then the, the, the food stores would go in and program food, you know, as exempt versus a different code and they have to worry about putting it under a different letter in the, on the state form. I can tell you as a former chief tax auditor, it's, it's a nightmare in the state collection system trying to keep track of all those different so filing would codes. A, would it become an accounting nightmare for the businesses as well? Well, I don't know so much for, for the <laughs> nightmare, but what will happen is, is you'll have a business, say, that's another retail that's new that won't be sure which code to file under the 2.5 or the 2, and they'll go, hey, let me pick the lowest. So then you'll have a guy like Joe trying to go in and, and try to send them letters. No, you know, that's the food tax. That's not the general tax. And it becomes a nightmare from an enforcement I would, I would imagine, though, that if you stop and think about who are the grocers in town, well, they're, they're all over the state or they're all over the nation. They've, they've, they know how to work this. So no, they're not worried about the grocers. I'm worried oh, about the I know the what others. you're saying yeah. on the other end. Yeah, right. I, I understand that. Yeah. Um, with that, I'm going to transition this over to Larry uh, to talk about property taxes, and then we will go to Anna to talk about the meat of tonight's presentation. So. Okay, thank you, John. Um, and I'm going to ask Anna to change the slides for me as we go through this so that that transition goes a little easier. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about property taxes. and. One of the things I uh, wanted to start with on that is uh, just a discussion and a reminder of the two types of property tax that the city of Goodyear has. The first is the primary property tax, and those funds are used for general government activities. The council has adopted a policy that we will maximize the, the um, primary property tax. The secondary property tax is the property tax that pays for the debt service on the general obligation bonds, or the GO bonds, as we generally refer to them as. Goodyear property tax rate, as you saw earlier, uh, with the recommendations of the Goodyear um, task force back in 2004, dropped the recommended or the ceiling property tax rate from $2.10 um, per hundred down to $1.60 per hundred. And that was actually implemented for the first time in 2005-2006. This past year, the city council uh, dropped the property tax rate on the secondary property tax on a one-year basis from the dollar sixty to a dollar forty two that resulted in an eleven percent decrease in the property tax rate that the city charges it's important to understand that the rate is only one element of your property tax bill most residential properties in the city of goodyear realized a tax decrease in excess of that rate as a matter of fact, on mine, and I just looked it up today just so I could give an example, uh, my house, the city property tax only, between those two years decreased by 42% because my assessed valuation dropped. Mm -hmm. So you have two variables that work together in doing that. Larry, do you have an average on the, uh, you know, I know there's CFDs and there's a lot of different school districts, but do you have on average what the total city portion of an average bill is with and without a C uh, CFD? Without, without a CFD, the city's, um, I believe, is in the 12 to 14 percent range. Okay. I think when you get into the CFDs, it starts to go higher and probably in the 20% range or a little higher for the CFD. Okay. Uh, and I mean, just the city's portion. I mean, the city's portion. Oh, actually, yeah, the city's portion within a CFD would go down because the total property right. tax rate go, goes up in those cases. That's correct. The only reason why I ask is I get a lot of questions sometimes from citizens. They talk about high taxes or whatever. They, and, I, and I, you know, it would be nice, I think, to 
and I know we used to have a breakdown by uh, um, CFD area to kind of show, you know, how the city overall tax breaks down on maybe a hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollar house because it's 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 the smaller percent usually of the entire bill, and some some of them don't quite understand on how that breaks out. And I think it would be helpful because I know with that dollar forty two, it's the lowest it's been in twenty years from a rate standpoint. So. It would be nice to have that, you know, when, when, when I'm asked those type of questions to show them on roughly how that kind of breaks down. And we can do that by CFD area, but the calculation gets extremely complex because we're also part of five different school districts within our community. So it's not only what CFD you might be a member of, but what school district and so forth. Well, but I think we can work some general formulas oh, for you by right. CFD, look at some sample properties and give okay. you some of those percentages. I think it would just be helpful when I get asked those questions, I can kind of show them something there. Okay. Um, this, this schedule shows the history of the property tax rate. This is the City of Goodyear property tax rate only. And you see on the top of the list is the most recent year, fiscal year 1011, with the dollar 42 that the council adopted. The five previous years to that was at a dollar 60, and then as you can see, it was ranging up to you know the two dollar and ten cent area and two dollar area, dating back to 96, 97, as Councilman Pazillo referred to a few minutes ago. Uh, for some very strange reason, I was looking through old um, budget books today. Don't ask why. Um, it's <laughs> what we do. Time. That's what he does in his spare time. Right. For entertainment, it's right. the best we can do. And we saw, I believe it was 86, 87 is the last time that, that Goodyear's property tax rates were actually below a dollar ninety or below this level now. And that's kind of what you were referring to. That's well over 20 years that they've been at these rates. How do we compare to the other jurisdictions locally? Uh, or is that coming? I was just going to look. I don't <laughs> think we included that in this particular schedule. Um, there is a broad spectrum. I think that the dollar sixty kept us, I'm going on memory, but I believe that kept us fairly close to Glendale. Um, at a dollar eighty, I remember Phoenix is like a dollar eighty two. Um, I believe Tolleson is over two dollars. Many cities are also lower than us. It really crosses a broad spectrum. Some don't have a property tax at all or a primary property tax. Yeah, yeah. yeah we can get you that information. Larry, it might be cities. early in the game, but if you move remove all of the water and the sewer, the remaining out, the levy, you know, from the secondary property tax, and it covers it, what's left. And you add your new debt for uh, 11, 12. Can we still possibly hit the dollar 40? Uh, I would say highly unlikely. Uh, we have the preliminary estimate from the county. I want to say there's good news and bad news, and the good news is it's above zero. Um, <laughs> yeah, the bad, the news bad news is that it is about a. Um, 20 some 18 percent lower I believe mm. than last year's so our estimates we may be able to under that assumption keep it uh, within and I'm assuming we'll be able to keep it in the dollar 60 range I just hope the public is aware that this is just a one time on this lowering to a dollar 42 it, it well, me well that people I, I'm are going, going to see to the 210 yeah, well, <laughs> if we would have maintained the 210 years ago, we wouldn't be in the situation today. Yeah, well, I moved to the city and I bought a home under the 210, so. <laughs> well, so was that. Yeah. Um, okay. If I, uh, can I go to the next slide? Because yeah, this talks a little I bit. I want to make sure that we're, we're constantly reminding the public of that so we don't end up. I think what. Actually, this slide kind of leads a little bit to that, and there's been some discussion at this level, and, and I think uh, it's a discussion you want to have. There's two different ways that governments use, local governments, and uh, particularly cities in Arizona use to, uh, to do their property tax rates. One is what's called a floating rate, where you uh, put your primary tax at whatever it works out to based on the levy, 
you calculate your secondary tax and you charge whatever that ends up. That, that determines your tax levy. The opposite end of the spectrum is where we do what we have been doing in the past where we do it at a fixed rate. And that is at the dollar sixty, we manage to the dollar sixty rate and make sure that we keep it at that level. What are the advantages of each of these? The floating rate, quite frankly, from our perspective as a staff, is easier to manage. And the reason is, is it's a, a simple calculation. Whatever the number comes out for the levy, it is what it is, and and you go on with it. Property taxes pay for debt service needed that year as well as they would do the maximum on the primary as, as the council has already established by policy. The property tax rate be, may be lower or higher than the fixed rate depending on what that levy comes into. And very simply remember the rate is only one function of your total levy, one that you adopt as a council, but two, as it affects your own taxes on your property. The second variable in that equation is the assessed valuation, okay? And so the assessed valuation times the rate gets you the total tax collected. The advantages of a fixed rate is that the property tax rate will not change from year to year. That's the rate that doesn't change. So one of the variables remains constant. As your assessed valuation changes, it's easier for a citizen to understand because if my assessed valuation goes up, I know the rates remaining the same, my bill will go up. As the assessed valuation goes down, the rate remains the same, my total tax bill will go down. Where you get into what can be confusion for people is in, in a bond election or in your truth and taxation public hearing. Well, how does this impact me and my house? If you're on a fixed rate, it can be that simple. The rate remains the same as your value goes up. Your taxes will go up as your value goes down. Your taxes will go down. It can be a different equation where your tax levy can go in opposite directions because of your change in valuation. And that's where the floating rate is more complex. As I say, for us, it's easier to manage but it is more complex, I think, for a voter to understand. From my perspective, the reason why I like the floating rate is when times are good and you keep your rate the same, you're getting money. What you're doing is you're managing to how much money you can generate. So when times were good and we were, you know, houses were growing at 30 or 40 percent a year, you had 30 or 40 percent more money because you kept the rate the same and assessed valuations were going up. When times are bad, you may have the debt service to pay, but if you keep the rate the same, you might not have enough money to cover the debt service. So what happens? You've got to dip into your general fund to pay the debt service. So, you know, to me, if you manage to truly the need of, of the levy, which is to pay for your debt service, and then don't, don't oversubscribe your debt service, to me it's more realistic than with a rate. Because in good times, a lot of money came in. Bad times, now you're trying to figure out how to pay the debt. Okay, question then. So because cool. aren't we always two years behind? more or less, or is it? The assessed valuation okay. lag is two years. Okay, That's so correct. if we stuck with the, I just want to make sure I understand this right. So if we stuck with the floating rate, and, and as a homeowner, next year your values go down again, because we're still going to be feeling that for the next couple years, then they will be paying more um, tax. So, so really, we could be looking at five years of not really, um, I mean, if you were to say we went from the 1.43 or whatever and then next year you're kind of seeing a 1.60, well, what's the year after that? I mean, if you could say for the next five years, if we stuck with the floating rate and say we've, we still know we have, you know, another year or maybe another two years of seeing less valuation of a home, are we then going to go from 1.6 to 1.8? To 2.1, you know what I'm saying? In the it's next just five years, more the risk or the less risk. You know, I look at this like a, like an arm or a, you know, uh, when you have an index on it, you know, it's going to go up two percent a year. And that's what six. I'm asking. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at this, that's what I look. So the, it, 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 you're you're just gambling in a sense that that well, that the that the uh, value is going to be such and such. But you're just kind of saying, okay, 
Well, we have the same issue with the CFDs now, Mayor. But isn't that, is that kind of the, well, can, I, 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 can I use that as a comparison? I, I, you, I, you don't understand I, what I just said, do you? Because you're looking at me. <laughs> no, I understand. I think it's a council dialogue that you're having. Yeah, yeah. I, I, the, the problem we have is the same thing we have with the CFDs right now is the secondary property taxes use the covered debt service. So if what happens is if you don't go floating, and it's just from my perspective, what happens is is if the things decline like, you know, Council Member Osborne is mentioning about, what happens is, is you won't have enough money, you know, because of the rate to cover it. So you're going to have to either dip into your general fund or some other revenue source to pay your debt service, as opposed to lining up your debt service with the secondary property tax. To me, the key issue is not to grow your levy unless you truly need that project to be done. And then you can manage those increases that you're talking about, as opposed to using a rate which generates revenue or decreases revenue as a result of valuations. I think it, there's more... Um, uh, I think there's, there's, there's more that you have to do and you have to justify those increases in projects because as you increase projects, you increase levy, and as you increase levy, that's going to impact the cost of everybody. So I, I guess it's a matter of different perspective. I've always not been a crazy pro uh, proponent of the, the rate because, like I say, in good times, you, you're, you're managing how much money you can generate. In bad times, you may not have enough money to cover your debt. I'm just, that's, I was just asking about how that projected out, how we could, could see you know, what that means in these two different scenarios, you know. Um, we have that information that we can get you. Um, like on a $100,000 home, just kind of a, oh, you well, know, oh, just a projection, see. just to see okay. what that, you know, would look like. And right. The, the variable, and this is what I want to, the sixty rate uh -huh. on a $100,000 home would be $160, okay? If you keep the rate the same, and you, that changes by 10%, whether it goes up or down, that change then becomes $16 on that home based on the valuation, okay? Now in theory, if every house, uh, if now I'll switch to the floating rate. Let's say that house was $100,000 and went down by 10%, but every other house went down exactly by 10%, the total property tax levied on each house would be exactly the same in both years. It'd just be at a different rate. It'd be a higher rate that would offset that, that value. Does that make sense to answer your question? I understand the differences. I was just trying to see, I'd like to see a projection. would like to see, a, we'll give yeah, you visuals of that. A visual. Yeah, I think I would need visuals too, but my concern is, is switching it from a fixed to a floating and a down market because of our high, we do have a high debt burden, clearly. I mean, we, we have a lot that we have to pay. Um, I, I think Joe's 100% right. You, you should always watch your projects. Unfortunately, we have them. We can't get rid of them right now, so we have to pay them. The debt's there to stay. Yes. It, it seems to me if you switched in a down market, you'd be basically, people would be paying more, which, although I understand the whole rate issue, to the person who opens their bill, you're going to say, I have to pay this much more. It's a pseudo tax increase, mm -hmm. even though I understand. I just don't know if there's a when the economy fixes, maybe relook at it. That's just my. It just seems like you're paying more now when you probably don't want to be paying more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, let's. If it's okay, we'll move on to, wanted to have a brief discussion of the rainy day funds because that's another variable as you look through options that you'll want to be looking at. The current practice for our rainy day funds is to uh, have four months of rainy day funds, four months of ongoing operating expenditures within the rainy day funds. And the current budget that we have adopted, that totals about $16.3 million. There are three elements that make up the rainy day fund. The first is the cash basis fund. That is the fund that is, that is referred to in the charter as the permanent revolving fund. To, um, <laughs> and, and that one, basically, the city council has no discretion to use that money. And that totals the 2997000 that you see in the first bullet up there. The second one, or the revenue stabilization account, is out of your financial policies that are included in your budget. Um, 
that you adopt each year, and that one totals about $3.1 million, and that number you do have more discretion over. If you were to spend that number, you would start replenishing it again, and it just works slowly up. The remaining amount in there is what we refer to as the additional rainy day fund, and that is just the difference between the calculated four months and those other two calculations, and that works out to about $10.3 million. Um, yeah, let's go on. We wanted to give you, as I, I apologize for the busyness of this, but as we looked at it, we need to give a frame of reference. What do other communities do? And, and the real question is, where are rainy day fund policies compared to other communities? I'm not gonna go through this in depth. What I'll tell you, and you can look at it a little closer, what I'll tell you as you look at it is, is that generally our policies at four months are a little, the four months is a little on the high end, but there are others that are higher than us. Uh, you'll notice that the city of Phoenix is only $31 million for their billion dollar budget. But they have other fund balance items that are, that are included and there's just differences in accounting amongst all of these entities that we give this to you only to give you kind of a broad overview of what other communities are doing. For the past 30 years, I've been trying to get guidance from the organization that I belong to, which is a Government Finance Officers Association. It's a national organization. I've sat at a number of um, round tables where we've asked that question, what should fund balance be? What should the rainy day fund be? And the one thing I can tell you consistently that's come out of that is that's a good question. <laughs> um, and it's, I've seen a lot of communities do it at 10%. Um, so ours is a little bit on the high end. We just wanted to uh, give you that. Now I will tell you that the, rain, that, that the rating agencies, and uh, John mentioned that a little earlier in the presentation that we've sustained our rating with the rating agencies. Our fund balances, you can see here that they, they like higher fund balances, but what's really important to them is that we have a plan in place that we are showing what we're doing, we're following that plan, and that becomes very important to them, that, that we're managing to a plan, and, and, we, and it makes sense of how we're doing, and it shows consistently with that. So unless there are any questions on that or the property tax, um, Ready to move back. This to is going to be the fun part. Oh, you know, Anna actually has the fun part of this job, hey. although I'd be scared <laughs> to death if I was in front of the keyboard. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but Anna is so great. I mean, she built this, and, and it's just wonderful. So I'll just turn it over to Anna. Okay, thank you. Um, as John said, now we're going to move on to the dashboard part of the presentation. And the dashboard is a tool that was created by um, staff using the five-year forecast. This is the same five-year forecast, as John mentioned, that was used by budget staff um, to build the current fiscal year budget. It's useful to show the general impacts of revenue in rainy day fund changes, um, but although it might be showing you specific numbers when we make changes, the dashboard should be considered a guide. It's not an exact science. It is meant to show trends. The numbers are a forecast. They're based um, on a point in time. And of course, staff is continuously reevaluating and updating estimates based on new data. So these numbers will definitely change. Um, you'll be able to manipulate them and show what how trends can happen, what or what the trends <coughs> will be. Um, and as John said earlier, um, they're not exact, and national, state, and local economic recovery is unknown, and that will play a part. First, I'll briefly describe the components of the dashboard, and then I'll go onto a screenshot so you can see what we'll be, what we'll be looking at. As we've been discussing during the presentation, the variables we'll be able to manipulate on the dashboard are the sales tax, restaurant tax, hotel tax, construction sales tax, and rainy day fund. The rainy day fund is not a revenue or a part of the operating budget, but we're showing it here for illustrative purposes, um, as council may find it relevant to this discussion. Uh, the dashboard shows the impacts of the tax rates and rainy day fund changes to the structural deficit. Okay, yeah, that was my question. So if the structural deficit goes up or down, the rainy day fund is where you're, you're making those deposits. Okay. 
So um, here's a screenshot of the dashboard. As you can see, it's an Excel spreadsheet loaded with budget information. And I have copies if it's too hard to read those. Um, on the left, oh, was that clear? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to feel bigger if you read. On the left, you can see um, the variables that you'll be able to manipulate are the retail sales tax, restaurant sales tax, hotel and motel and construction sales tax, um, along with the rainy day fund. And then when you change variables, so when you change these variables, um, we will change them in these cells. Um, so you'll see fiscal year 11, 12 through fiscal year 15, 16. We change the tax rates as well as the rainy day fund you'll be able to change. Any changes that you make will be shown in the estimated budget impact section. So you see the total difference will appear on this line, this top line down here in the red. And then the structural deficit will decrease or increase depending on the changes you make. Um, tonight, staff won't be giving you direction or recommendations, but we have put together a few scenarios to show you how the dashboard works. So if there are no questions on that, I'll move on to these. Does anyone have any questions on the dashboard so far? So one scenario that we've run for you was decreasing the retail sales tax by 0.5% in fiscal year 12-13. Uh, this is the year council directed that the sales tax increase should be revisited. Um, we discussed that during the fiscal year 9-10 budget. And you, so you see here um, in the red circle, work, in fiscal year 12-13, uh, I reduced that to 2% and it carried through the following years. And you see that's reflected down here in the estimated budget impacts. You see how that, um, the total difference decreases mm -hmm. each year, and that impacts the structural deficit. So the structural deficit also decreases, or increases, I guess. Increases. 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 <laughs> um, so with, after that scenario, for argument, instead of changing the tax rate to, from 2.5 to 2% 2 in 12-13, we change it instead when we have um, estimated that the mall will open. And as John said earlier, for the purposes of this model, we're estimated the mall to open in 14-15. Again, you see that the 2% is circled over on, on the right, um, and it carries through the following years, and you see that it impacts the total difference in structural deficit. A final alternative scenario we'll show you considers a reduction in the restaurant and bar sales tax rate. In this scenario, the restaurant and bar sales tax is reduced by 0.5%. Um, next fiscal year in 11-12, and you see that it shows up down here in the total difference and it impacts the structural deficit. Uh, the restaurant and bar sales tax is a smaller portion of the total sales tax collections. It's about 16% <laughs> of overall sales tax collections as compared to 81% of the total or the uh, retail sales tax. So those are the three scenarios that we have run. What, what, um, is, what is that, that number? Is it uh, 500? 582. In 11, 12. Okay. 582. Mm -hmm. So it costs you 582 is what, is what you're saying on there. How does that impact the uh, fund balance itself? I see the structural deficit, but you say that's all rolling into the fund balance. Does it show what the fund balance impact would be as a result of this? The actual fund balance in the rainy day we fund. Didn't, we didn't separate that from the rainy day fund. We just showed it as the structural deficit and cumulative difference here. But I assume then the rainy day fund of $16.9 million, that's what's coming off of that cumulatively? Is that a fair assessment? Nothing's coming out of the rainy day fund. You can, if you want to alter the rainy day fund, we can, but we're not, that's not altering the rainy day fund. That's just showing you what would happen with the Well, it, well I mean, if the structural deficit is $3 million, it's got to be coming <laughs> from somewhere. So where's the $3 million coming from? Oh, it would have to come from the rainy day fund in order to operate. Right. But he's just showing it. So yeah. That so I guess my point is if 16.9 million is our rainy day fund and you're running a structural deficit of three, unless you have the savings during the year, then that would have to reduce the rainy day fund, right? The, uh, Am I missing? The, uh, no, uh, the, I think we understand. I think what the dashboard is designed to do is as you go in, in this particular scenario, you might ask Anna to change the rainy day fund to offset that difference and to show you what that would look like. And well, that well, is okay. the opportunity that you have as we go to this okay. dashboard. Okay. And I, th I think it's important to remember that this isn't our tool to balance the budget. 
at yeah, all. It's just, an, it's just to show you the impacts of revenue changes. Um, so we can change the rainy day fund. We did rainy day fund. We will be able to take that down, but you'll see your savings account here will decrease, and then you'll have to build it back up. Well, I know, and that's what I'm trying to get a feel feel for. There is, is how that structural deficit is actually getting funded. You know, sometimes you'll be able to fund it because you have savings during the year, or cash savings, or fund balance increases. That may make up some of that, and some of it may have to tap into your rainy day fund. So that's what I'm just trying to get a feel from a balance standpoint. I, I think it's important that um, it, it, we've always had a structural deficit for the past few years. We've always managed to it. And so as you look at these, in this example, for example, uh, these aren't that bad. I mean, and you should start showing a profit, so to speak, a surplus in fiscal year 14, 14 15. and yeah. 15. So uh, you're right, Joe, but basically I think that you would use the rainy day fund to leverage you over into the next fiscal year. So so it may not, I mean, for example, this past fiscal year, we still had the $16.9 million in the rainy day fund because we were able to take, I think it was 3 or $4 million in some savings to cover that structural deficit, so you still had the rainy day fund. So that's, that's the point I'm trying to get. I guess it's maybe a little too early in the process, but you still may have some savings in a, in a couple other areas, so you still have the $16 million rainy day fund as a result of still being able to drop some of those tax rates down, I, I guess is what I'm kind of getting to. Is that, does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but That's remember it. in the discussion, John talked about the additional maintenance and you referred to also right. that we'll have to take on. So if, if I understood what you were saying that if you reduced the revenue base, we could absorb that from fund balance savings this year, I don't know that I would agree with that. Well, I don't know the, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I'm just asking that question, you know, because all I'm seeing here is that the impact of 500000 but I don't know whether that 500000 can be absorbed or not absorbed, and that's what I'm kind of getting to. Sure. You're right. I don't have the answer to it. I'm, I'm just, I'm but just the curious. The way that we can really predict, Joe, whether to answer that question specifically whether or not we will be able to Those absorb it until the end of the year. Okay. I just think for us novice, this is quite good. Do oh, you it's, agree it's, that when you look at that, you can see as you... Well, well so, uh, I understand does, what you're does, Pardon me? Well, I'm, we I'm, also I'm, include the surplus from the year before. Doesn't that go in there, too, or does that not? Yeah. That's what it does. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and that's what, I, that's what I'm kind of referring to. Yeah, I, I think it helps to show the actual revenue impact on there. And again, maybe it's a little early in the process, but trying to get the old wheels turning here on, on what you can and what you can't, because I know you're going to have some maintenance increases and some other things that, that this may not be possible to do because they may eat up, you know, whatever. Well, and, and what we did do, Joe, and we note some of these operating budget, for example, goes up each year. And then we show the percent that we've increased the budget. I referred to those in my presentation. And then we also, the sales tax revenue increase at the bottom, we're showing what we're projecting there. And then the construction sales tax revenue in increase. And then the important thing also is the mall opening date. Uh, the mall opening date here is 1415, and that has a significant impact uh, as we go through this, you'll see, uh, in the 1415. So you're so, suggesting that we drop the 0.5 no, I don't. on the sales tax. We don't. We hold it until 14. Well, I'm not no, suggesting, no. but that's one of the. Uh, we aren't making any suggestions tonight. But that is one of the yeah. things that is. Showing. That's one of the scenarios. Yes. Of yes. And if I, I read this correctly, a half a cent drop in the restaurants, 500,000. A, a, a percent drop is a million, and a percent and a half would be a million five. So yes. it's about a half a million for every half a half a percent is yes. what I'm reading, and that's pretty much what it's telling me. It doesn't tell me any more than that right now, other than that's what it's. Okay. That's correct. Okay. I really, I, I really um, hate to see us making any assumptions with the mall. You know that that hurt us in the past, and I really, I mean, it's it's great to look at the forecast of it, but I really hate to see us putting that into our figures budgeting wise. I, you know, I just don't think we have. I just don't think we should do that again. That's we my own opinion. One of those but, uh, a, a scenario sure. The mall in there. Yeah, you you ask Anna what. You want to? Oh, I see. And then she'll bring it back. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, with the dashboard, we'll have numerous versions. So what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to go through, and it's however you want to proceed. Um, we have numerous versions. We can save them. We can give them to you. You can save them for later. But we can see both scenarios. Right. Yeah. 
So I, I would prefer not to do, a, I would prefer seeing both. Yes, you with, with them all. And without them and all. Without yeah. them all. Yeah. Sure. And then you're, sure. not to eliminate that because well, it's it's still my crystal still, ball may be more positive than your crystal ball. So it's but it's but it's bit us in the past, and so I just I, I we all know it's going to be here. We all know that, but I just don't want to rely on it. Can yeah, I'd like to see both like scenarios lower, too. Like I want to see two five percent, like a more of a gradual. Sorry to put all yes. that extra work, but yeah. I think two. Well, it, it, it's short. automatic. Okay. I mean, so why don't you go on, Anna, to okay. Um, so here you'll see the dashboard. This is the actual dashboard that we can go through. Um, this is not here. No. This is the this well, is the blank the slate. Here. This is the current. Um, this is the, the one you have that I just that we just passed out. That's the one that we just the passed one out. one single sheet. Thank you. Um, so we can go through. So if you say next year we want to take the retail sales tax retail sales tax down to two percent, then it automatically does that. But it didn't carry through to the next year's. You did eleven twelve. Did you have it started? It didn't. It did not. Mm. There, there it did. I don't know why this version, this version must have a glitch. I'm sorry. but. Okay, so there we took the sales tax down okay. half a percent in fiscal year 12 and 13. And that generated the numbers that you see below. If we also did it in 11, 12, take it down. Interesting. Let me, let me ask you this, and, and, and Larry, you might have it, or, or Joe might have a better idea of this, because he used to work there at the state as far as rate changes. Is it tougher on the business if you're changing like every other year or, you know, every year as opposed to, I mean, if you were going to gradually drop at a tenth of a percent, you know, for the next four years, is that more of a, a problem with businesses trying to get used to that and rescheduling as opposed to whatever you decide is the best time to, to make a decent and I guess Joe has seen it at the state when other cities have, have made rate changes. I'm just thinking from a business standpoint, if you're operating a business and every year it's dropping a tenth or two-tenths of a percent, is that more of an administrative burden? I'd rather hear from Joanne. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Joanne. Well, it, it is, it is um, a problem at the beginning, but, you know, with, with computers and cash registers, you just you change it. and. Yeah. Um, and then you have to change it on your sales tax monthly forms. So, you, don't you know, see it as a, okay. and, and you know, we just did it for the city, and then I had to do it again for the state. And so, you know what? You do it. And um, yeah, because the option getting all your employees to remember that's changed. Right. And so, you know, <laughs> yeah. I guess as a business owner, would you like to see it go down? I'd just rather see it go down. Well, yeah. <laughs> if, if, if I mean, as, as a way, was it better if just as a business owner? to go down incrementally, incrementally then. just to get it down or wait a few years and then have it go down in a chunk I guess I don't think that's really going to matter oh okay I really don't it's not real expensive to have those things reprogrammed or anything well like no that. I mean well now that I'm just speaking for myself that's just that's in house nobody else is doing that oh, now okay. some another business may have a whole different you know you go to a national chain like the grocery stores that might be more of a burden, yeah. you know. That could be. Yeah, I'm just curious. I don't. I don't have any history on no. that, uh, you know, on, on how that may break down. Because I could imagine the large ones like Safeway or whatever that's got to go in and reprogram. But there. Well, yeah. But that's sometimes re reprogramming a, a computer or something like that. Yeah. It's no. so simple these days. Okay. Like again, I don't have any experience on this. So I don't know how that that might impact. I I do know. I do know, like I say, being in the state collection systems, which we are, and you fill out those monthly sales tax reports, you just get a two-letter and a, and a code, you know, G, GY1, GY2, GY5, GY6, and a rate, you know. And uh, education is, and I can tell you as a former tax auditor, education is key because you'll have a bunch of people, if you have a lot of different rates, filing under the wrong code. They just will. I made a living doing that for years, so I can just tell you from experience. I guess that's my question. It looks like the people need relief now. The business owners need relief sooner rather than yeah. later. But it doesn't look like we can take such a, just from looking at your dashboard, as big a chunk. I, I think it's got to be done incrementally. Yeah. On our on our end, I mean, that's the way it looks. Just the numbers that come out. Mm -hmm. Could you just show incrementally? I mean, show point one in 12, 13, then point two in 13, 14, and point three in 14, whatever. 
gonna have to be done something like that. Yeah. And keep going there. So there's a scenario uh, mm -hmm. where it actually goes to a, a surplus or in fourteen fifteen. That now this is assuming the mall goes. Then it goes back into a, a deficit in, or a structural deficit. What if, okay, what if we were to, um, you know, I happened to notice when, when we were showing the, yeah. I hate to bring this up, but when we were looking at scenarios of other items within the cities, our construction sales tax was, was pretty high up there too. Um, and it's not like we're making a lot off of it. So I wonder if we were to, um, say we're to play and, and put the, in eleven twelve we were to put the restaurant bar tax at, 3.75 and we were to put the construction sales tax at 3.25 um, what does that do eh, half a million how about if we take that scenario and then we move the restaurant sales tax down another notch in the next year yeah, clear next year so three point instead of starting in 11 12 no keep 11 12 at 3.5 to 3.5 3.5 that's oh, I see what you're saying. The oh, gotcha. that. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, that does not kill. And again, if the mall co co does come forward, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, this is a relatively positive scenario. Mm -hmm. Now, what if, okay, uh, take the mall out. No, things. it didn't. Larry. Yeah, we did. Okay. Well, one of the reasons, what again, we put this in for um, just an overall visual to show themes here. Mm -hmm. You can really see that 14 and 15 will trend the same way that the earlier years without them all. We'd have to go in on the back end a little bit to actually take that out. We well, can get that for you. It's six million. Yeah, yeah you take it, six million it still off and add it. Yeah. 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 So it'd be a two million dollar deficit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's still a deficit. If okay. if that scenario is it. Yeah. Gotcha. I, this well, is like, really fantastic. Yeah, no, I, I like it. I, I, from my personal perspective, you know, when you look at the various rates, and this is just my own personal opinion, is I would like when it's fiscally, and again, stress that fiscally prudent. I don't want to do it until it's fiscally prudent. Is to me the two, the one main outlier, at least the one I hear from all the time, is the is the restaurant. And uh, you know, I would love to see that gradually come down a bit when it's fiscally prudent. And again, I can't stress that enough. Fiscally prudent. I like to see that four come down uh, because in the area when you think about it right now our 2.5 percent is the same as Avondale it's lower than Litchfield Park and it's lower than um, mm -hmm. um, Buckeye right now the restaurant is the outlier because at four percent at the four percent it's more than Avondale it's more than Litchfield Park and it's more than Buckeye now I realize it's been in, you know, on there for four, uh, for 20 years and I really don't think it's going to significantly impact people eating out. But at the same token, I don't know about you, but I hear it a lot that that's the outlier and that's the one that people like. But again, I can't stress enough fiscally prudent to do it. I don't want to cut something when we can't afford to cut it. But personally, to me, that's the one I would like to see. But I think you're hearing first. it because of the state. You know. You're hearing it well, because I know. all of a sudden uh, you're, you're 1% right. got in there. You got it. Now it's 11.3%. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's not. No, I agree with you. Well, and, and even just the, the public comments out there from the people that work in the restaurants themselves, when I sit there thinking my, my Frappuccino <laughs> just went up. Yeah. And, I, and you know what their, their first reaction is? Oh, it's the sales tax. It's the sales tax. That's what they say. And, and I'm like, oh, no, 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 it's 40 cents more on that. <laughs> right. You know, I still know it's, right. it's gone up. But, but still, that's the, the general theme that goes out there. And, and uh, when you say fiscally prudent, I mean, if you are sitting there looking at, um, and, I, and I know, Joe, that you were saying, how do we, um, um, oh, what's, what's, I forget what word you said, but, you know, how do you, how do you soak it in on the other side if you're, if you're taking it down half a million, where are we going to make up for right. it? Right, right. 
Well, um, it's got to be a growth in revenue, well, of course, or, or it's got to be a cut in expenses okay. somewhere. One of the two. So. And, and since you all seem to like those digital billboards, and you're telling me that, <laughs> well, that might give us the, might give us the revenue house. we need to balance that <laughs> out, Joanne. <laughs> Oh, no, never. No. Anyway. The, the, the yeah. billboards aren't in here. There you go. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't think you put them in yet. <laughs> How about if we take out food, or can we? I, I know we were talking about that. Is there a way to program it to take just the food portion out? Or well, lower as the food we portion? said, it was it's basically a half a percent. A uh, half percent is a million dollars. So Okay, so that would be take a million out of there. Yeah, just take uh, so yeah, what I would do is just. You said yeah. 1.1 million. Okay, so mm -hmm. just take a million. Okay. Basically, add a million to the deficit. Yeah. Fiscal year 11 12. Oh. Well, it'd be nice during the budget yeah, process it, once the like real your numbers oh, start coming. Yeah. Look at this. And, I, I, I really get the idea. So it just would be a million then. Yeah. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention on that the food is, and John referred to this earlier, the food is really, we don't know because it's not reported. We, our, our, our staff did an analysis and actually came out considerably lower than that million dollar estimate. But the city of Phoenix, they have the, their own sales tax team and the way it's reported. We thought that was a pretty good way to measure it. And that's like food so items, it's a broad not range, a half million to a million three, and I think that range will tell you what it is. But we really don't know, and that's at a half cent. What happens is, is when you report food, you report it on the same line that you report okay. retail. Mm -hmm. Those all together. So yeah. it really doesn't separate. No, I, I know it's an educated guess. I understand that. Somewhat educated. Somewhat educated. <laughs> any more questions? Okay. Do you have any report? No. Um, You're fine. Any council? ideas that you want us to to I run? Know, let, it, let me know. Yeah. And anything council wants to give the city manager? Anything you forgot no. to, to report on what your activities were? No. If not, I think the meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Good job. I like Good that. Job, that is Anna. very Good job. cool.